So I want to welcome you all. Thank you for being here. I consider it a great honor to be talking in front of this group. And I, I want to say up front that I have two purposes that I want to serve in, in what I have to say today. Number one, I want to fulfill the promise I made two videos back when I promised I was going to explain how it is that I can prove that we're all hallucinating most of the time, that we don't really know who we are most of the time, and we have solutions to that problematic situation. So I want to complete that, and at the same time I want to introduce an activity that is going on here. We have a small group of us who have come together with every intention of changing the world. It sounds, I know, it's, it sounds narcissistic and kind of arrogant and so on, but we actually are convinced that we're able to do this, that, that this is something doable because we've figured out how to go about it. And I've been at it now for 45 years on this path. And as I pointed out in that earlier video, I have blazed a trail with a few friends. We've actually blazed a trail that takes us out into the wilderness of the future to a destination fraught with peace, prosperity, and freedom. <clears throat> That's a big claim. And I don't expect you to just believe me because I'm saying these things, but the reality is we have figured out finally how to do it in considerable detail. And I'm going to share a couple of levels of that detail with you today and introduce a few of the people that are in this group with me making things happen because over the next few years we're going to be making a series of documentaries explaining this stuff for public consumption and this is just the first piece of that technology so I want to start out by going back to something I said in that previous video to the effect that most of us don't know who we really are. Most of us have hidden from ourselves the reality of who we are and what makes us tick. So I want to elaborate on that just a little bit. How would you go about lying to yourself? That's the key question. If you were going to tell yourself a lie, particularly a lie about yourself, how would you arrange to believe the lie? It ain't easy. So I call your attention to my finger, one finger. Is there anyone here who is blind in one eye? Because this, this argument I'm going to give isn't going to apply to you if you are, but most of you can see with both eyes, okay? And does everyone in the room see one finger that I'm holding up? Yes. Okay. Well, that's a hallucination. Why so? Well, think about how this vision thing comes about. Photons bouncing around in the room bounce off my finger and a few of them land in your eyes. They pass through the lens of each eye and form two little images, like photographs, on your retinas. Those images are not identical because you've got your eyes are separate and so the images are separate and different. How do you see only one finger when you've got two images? Well, the answer is that all of your sensory data input through all of your senses, your eyes, your ears, your fingertips, everywhere that you have sensation and awareness in your body, the information flows in, not to your conscious mind, which would be overwhelmed by it, but into your subconscious mind. And the subconscious is a fantastic, what's the word for it? It's, it's, it's a fantastic simultaneous activity manager, multitasker, right? So the information flows into your subconscious and the subconscious has noticed that the two images formed on your retinas 
are more different when an object is closer to you than when it's far away. When it's far away, the images are more similar. Now's where the hallucination happens. The retina sends signals into the brain, to the subconscious, and the subconscious sorts them out and says, ah, it would be really inconvenient for this guy to, uh, or gal, to go around with two separate images to juggle. So your subconscious creates a hallucination that is a combination of the two images. Now it's important to understand what is a hallucination. If the data stream going to my conscious mind is distorted in some way, if it has information added to it that didn't come in through the eyes, like information from memories or previous experiences. So there's that information, some of which gets added to the information stream to the conscious mind. Then there is deletion. If you only see one finger, a portion of the data that is represented by your retinas, your retinal images, a portion of that data has been deleted. When data is deleted from the consciousness stream or added to it or when it's distorted, that's a hallucination. So when you see one finger, you are taking these two images, taking the data from them, distorting it and recombining them into one image. That's the hallucination and you do it all the time and it's a good thing you do or you won't be able to see one image when I hold up one finger you'd see two images so we we do this all the time when I say hallucination it's not an accusation it's just a description of what we're doing all the time now I'll go beyond that a particular form of hallucination is known as amnesia where when you go to recall an experience, some of the data has been deleted from the stream that goes to your conscious mind. That's amnesia. So I'm going to ask you to ask yourself a question. Do you remember being three years old in nursery school and how that felt? Do you remember being two years old maybe the first time you said no to one of your parents? Do you happen to recall what happened when you did that? A lot of parents don't like it when the kid says no. And they usually start saying no at about the age of two. Do you remember? If you don't, you've got amnesia for that event. How about a little earlier when you were lying in the cradle waiting to be fed? And maybe you're one of those unlucky folks like I was whose parents fed you on a schedule instead of when you're hungry. So you wake up, and you don't speak yet, you're only maybe a year old, a year and a half old, and you look around, hey, who's there? Now at this point, what the infant needs is to be picked up, cuddled, eye contact made, and the mother and infant will literally mirror one another's facial expression. This is where we learn about our emotions. Because if mom happens to be angry and we mirror her face, our body feels the emotion of anger. There is this tight connection neurologically between the muscles of the face and the emotions. This was mapped out in great detail by a guy named Paul Eckerd. Eckerd. And you can learn all about him online. Or you can watch a, a TV series based on his research that was called Lie to Me. Now, let's go back even further. Do you remember having your diaper changed? Do you remember the expression on your mother's face when she changed your diaper? If you don't, you've got amnesia for all that. Now, why would you think you would have amnesia. Why would your subconscious delete those memories from conscious availability? Because that's what amnesia is. The memory's still there. You may not realize that yet, but those memories are still in your brain. 
but your subconscious is protecting you from them by hiding them. That's how we lie to ourselves. I want to give you an example of one of a whole bunch of different kinds of circumstances where this takes place and you'll begin to see the relevance of it to your life. <clears throat> Consider what happens to the infant who is left to cry himself to sleep when he's hungry and wants to be picked up and cuddled and taken care of, nurtured. But over and over, for many times, some in many instances, the kid is left to cry himself to sleep. And he goes to sleep hoping that when he wakes up, things will be different. And oh, oftentimes he wakes up and things are no change, nothing different at all. No change. What do you think that does to the infant? It teaches the infant that all the things he needs are scarce, unavailable, rarely to be had. That, that child grows up desperate. And that desperation in adults leads to certain kinds of politics. So when you meet a socialist who insists that the world owes him something, by golly, you didn't give it to me when I needed it. You owe it to me now, and I'll have it one way or another, is the mindset. And it comes from that infant experience of being left hungry. That's where socialism comes from. It's the origin of that political genre. You think that's a good thing for humanity? Uh -uh. No, it's a very bad thing for humanity, because these same people grow up wanting desperately to be given to and taken care of and nurtured and they are filled not with generosity and by the way they these people they will present themselves to the world as loving and caring and generous but they have very little to give they are low energy people they get depressed easily they often suicide out of that angry depression Suicide always comes from a form of anger turned inward. That's the nature of suicide. Everyone who's ever committed suicide was angry. Well, so we have this manifestation in the world of people who are, have very low resource capabilities putting themselves out as generous, giving to the world, Right, well, what have you got to give? Well, I've got a portion of what was given to me and it hasn't been much. Hmm. That's not a very reasonable political stand, but that's what they do. And they're angry about it. They are envious and filled with hatred. And it comes out, you see it in, in a lot of the things going on on the streets in the United States today, for example. You see it in the Antifa movement, big time. And it's very destructive. And we need to get away from that. This is just one kind of infant trauma that has huge implications to us on national and international scales. Wow. Now, I want to put a plug in here for Dana Martin because her work is specifically designed to reduce that kind of trauma in children, both when they are infants, when they're toddlers, and when they're school students. Get them out of the school and unschool them and start undoing the harm. She's written about radical unschooling and peaceful parenting, both very important. Her work and mine come together in a very logical way because my job, for the most part, for the last 45 years, has been picking up the pieces of the people who were traumatized, damaged, suffering, and they're looking for help. And we know now how to help most of them. I won't say all of them, but most of them. Okay, so the basis then for this thing that is happening here in Acapulco 
is that some of us have this awareness and then this leads to the question of well what are the implications in terms of our community because we need to bring our awareness down close to home if we're going to understand what we're doing it's not okay to just project it out in the world we're going to change the whole friggin world no we've got to bring it down to you and me those of us here now facing each other talking to each other that's where the action really happens it's important to realize that so let's do that consider what can happen when two people develop a relationship based on trust we'll go into in a few minutes how that comes about but if two people really trust each other what does that mean in 1974 beginning of 74 no, it was 70, I'm sorry, it was a little earlier, 72, the end of 72. I got together with a gal that I thought of as a playmate, someone I'd have fun with. And we made each other a promise. I will always be honest talking with you, and I will be forthright, which means I'm not going to hide from you what's going on in me. Whatever my emotional reaction is to you, I'll tell you. I'll show you. And we promise we'll never lay a hand on each other in anger, but we will always feel free to express whatever feeling comes along. That was a very important foundational agreement that we made. Is there anyone in this room who would not be willing to make such an agreement with someone you trust? I will always be honest with you. I will always be forthright. I will not hide who I am from you you will know exactly what's going on with me all the time. Anyone unwilling, put your hand up. If you're not willing. You're talking about females? <laughs> <laughs> I said with someone you trust. Sometimes less is more. Ah. Well, my wife and I were together for 38 years. I think I have the credential necessary to speak as someone who knows what a good relationship can be. And that was the start of it. And we fought with each other for five years because we didn't know how to do this thing that we had agreed to do. We did it. We never touched each other in anger. We expressed a lot of anger. Oh, yeah, we got loud, expressed ourselves very vigorously. And then we learned some things that allowed us to get past that. And it stopped. All the anger stopped. And for the rest of the 38 years, until she died, we had a relationship that today is by far the best one I've ever had. And I would love to have another relationship as good as that. It took a lot of work, but it was very rewarding, very sustaining emotionally. So imagine two people get to where they can have that kind of relationship. If two people can do it, guess what? You can scale that up to a small group. Say eight people, maybe nine. Certainly it can be done at eight. And in fact, I participated in 17 years of experiments in such groups to find out how do you do it in a small group. And we found out there were certain factors that had to exist in groups. We couldn't have a big group and do it. We, we experimented with groups all the way from two people to 20 people. And we found that the group gelled the best, worked the best, felt the best, and maximized the creativity of the people in the group when the group was eight people. And we tried different mixes of men and women. Four and four turned out to be best. We also tried different means of making decisions in the group. And we found out that it works best when all the decisions are unanimous. If it isn't unanimous, it's not a group decision. Oh, how about that? Well, we started off calling such group octets. And then we found out that there was a process we could use to amplify the creativity of the group, but it would take people three days of work 
to, be, to get ready for that process. My mentor, John David Garcia, called that process autopoiesis. Three days. Well, he had designed it. I redesigned it, got it down to about three hours. And so now I call those, that process amplification. It amplifies creativity. And with that amplification in place, a group of eight people will maximize their creativity and do wonderful things. I call that kind of a group an octologue. And you've heard, many of you have heard that word before, the octologue. What is it? Well, a lot of experimenting with it, we found out it's not easy to create a real octologue. And the reason it's difficult is because of this thing I was talking about before, people are lying to themselves about who they are. They're too busy presenting themselves as generous when they are hateful, uh, in pain, when they are envious. You can't be generous when you're envious. <laughs> it doesn't work. It's that kind of lying to oneself that we have to get past if we're going to have octologues at work. So, with some more effort and work and time and experiments, we've come up with a process for getting from here to there. And I call the process the trail. In the last video I referred to it as the trail to the experience of peace, prosperity, and freedom. We can have, we, anyone, can have peace, prosperity, and freedom. I have been living most of my life now, as an, since, I don't know, some years now, I have been living in a way that is peaceful, prosperous, and free. Is it totally optimized now, today? No, I'm still working on it. But it gets better and better. And I want to invite everyone seeing this video, everyone, to consider following the trail. Now, when I was a youngster, I used to go canoeing in the Canadian wilderness and from time to time went to places where very likely no one had been previously. And I blazed a trail. I took an axe and I would knock a chunk of bark off a tree and it would leave a white spot that you could see from several miles away. <clears throat> and by doing a series of those, we wind up with a trail. Well, in the frontier world where we're exploring, we have trailblazers. And then we have pioneers. At this stage, I'm looking for pioneers. I blazed the trail. I know how to get there. I know how to, how to find peace, prosperity, and freedom in my life. And it turns out to do that, you've got to maximize truth, awareness, love, and creativity. That is the mechanism by which you get peace, prosperity, and freedom. I don't know another mechanism. If there were an easier way, I'd be pimping it. <laughs> I don't know an easier way. This way works. We did the experiments. We ran the experiments. We had group meetings again and again and again for 17 years. So when I tell you I know how to do this, some of you hopefully will take my word for it and actually begin doing it. And there are a few here in the room who have begun doing it with me every Saturday afternoon. And I'm going to be calling on some of you in a, in a moment to talk about your experience of that. But bear, bear in mind, we've just gotten started. We've only been at it for about five, six weeks, and we're just getting started. The process begins with noticing the memories that we're missing, noticing the amnesia, and quickly moves to where we begin having a conversation between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. I hope you all know that you've got a subconscious mind, and I'm guessing that most of you rarely have that conversation between the two. So I want to forewarn you 
your subconscious may feel neglected because you haven't been talking to him or her. And so when you begin this process, there are some difficulties getting your subconscious to believe that you're worth listening to. Because when was the last time you had this conversation? The net result of this process that I'm beginning to describe will be harmony between the conscious and subconscious mind, your conscious and subconscious mind. Now, how does that manifest in our interactions? Well, if I'm honest with myself, I have at least the capability of being honest with you. If I'm not honest with myself, how do you think I can be honest with you? If I am telling myself I'm generous and giving and caring and I'm really envious and hateful, how can I be honest with you or with anyone? And that's only one particular kind of trauma. There are at least five different kinds of trauma that can distort our interactions with one another. And it's my mission to teach everyone I can what the traumas are, how to recover from them, and then how to integrate that new information into our lives so that we can be honest with each other and maximize creativity and get out from under the boot of the people who would control us. Those of us here in Acapulco who left other countries, we ran away because we were not willing to continue to obey arbitrary political dictates. We won't do it. But that's not enough. If you want to have a world of peace, prosperity, and freedom, we've got to take this other dimension of knowledge and spread it around. And that's what I am doing and have been doing for 45 years. I'm inviting some of you, as many of you who, as who want to, I invite you to get on the trail. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy because you've got a whole childhood for which you have a lot of amnesia and on top of that you've got all those years of indoctrination in school and some people have been subjected to a lot of indoctrination in their workplace as well. So you're going to be bucking the tide as it were. The trail is not an easy trail, it's a wilderness trail and we're still exploring as pioneers we may be equipped to settle down when we find a place we like. We may be equipped for that, but we need to do some exploring at the same time. This trail is going to have many branches to it, leading to all kinds of experiments that some of you will be doing. So, the trail, when enough of us have gone down that trail, it'll become a pathway. And the pathway will become a dirt road. And the dirt road will become a little one-lane logging road kind of road. And it'll become a two-lane road and a highway and a superhighway. And eventually, young children will be introduced to this pathway in a loving way. It will not be traumatic. They will avoid the traumas that most of us have gone through. They will not have it come into, into, a, into their adulthood with amnesia. We'll solve that problem. And hopefully, the expertise that I've been working on developing for the 45 years will become obsolete. We won't need it anymore. It's my mission to become obsolete, to become dispensable. But in the meantime, there are things you can be doing that will enhance your lives and make a difference in the world. So, at this point, I would like us to take a few minutes break to get organized for the next segment that we're going to do in a few minutes from now. Okay, so here we are after the break, and I'm going to ask Michael Nimitz to come up and stand here in front of the camera for a few minutes and talk to you about 
why he is involved in this. Why is he in this group? Michael, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm going to get off the camera and well, I'll let you... I'm need your mic, am I? Oh, uh, oh, that's right. You need the mic. Okie dokie. Well, I think if you just stand there, Bob... I'll, just I'll stand here. Stand. <laughs> just tell me if the sound is all right with that. All right. I didn't mean to deprive you of the mic. One, two, three. Is that good? Or it sounds a little hollow. <clears throat> All right, I'll try and speak up. How's that sound? Yeah, All right. All right, so what was the question, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, why are you in this group? What, what is your experience of the work that I've been doing here? And how, how do you see that in terms of your future? Uh, what might you or anyone get from being in a group like this one? Well, uh, just a little introduction to my understanding of the, what Bob brought to the table as I first started with the Octolog. Uh, I had uh, been a construction manager and I'd been in the military. Uh, I'd always kind of had a, a understanding of how organization meant something to get something done. And uh, I had kind of uh, grasped the idea of uh, Deming's work, mm -hmm. and so that was kind of a, like my first introduction to ethical behavior in an organizational environment, and how well that could drive productivity. So when I saw Bob's thing with the Octolog, that was the first thing that draw, drew me to it. But uh, it wasn't until a year later that uh, I was involved with the workshop with Bob that uh, uh, I was introduced to his ideas on soul bonding. And to me that was really the key to understanding like what actually gets people to the this idea of the value of the Octolog. And that was is that uh, you know we've got a lot of trauma. We've got a lot of things that have been conditioned into us that we believe to be true, but they're actually false. And so this was kind of the introduction to that. And then subsequently, uh, Bob put together a, a weekly kind of training session on, on the idea of soul bonding. And I was able to learn quite a bit about uh, the subconscious mind and how useful that is to me getting things done. In fact. It kind of got, I got a discovery of my father's uh, experience with sleeping on things. You know, he would have problems at work and so forth. And he'd kind of review those things at the end of the day and then he'd sleep on it. And then in the morning he'd wake up and he'd have a cup of coffee. He'd get out on the deck, and out, in, out in nature and, and kind of review his, the, you know, what his subconscious mind had, had brought to him in, in regard to answers. And so I had kind of uh, adopted that into my philosophy as well. But soul bonding is essentially, is really kind of that element of, of working with your subconscious mind. And like Bob said, when you, uh, when you really apply your subconscious mind, which is, is really the mansion of your mind, with your conscious mind being the, the, uh, the bloom closet, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of ability that most of us don't even realize that we have. And I, I think that's really the, uh, the gist of what I'm trying to get out of what Bob is doing is to learn how to utilize my subconscious mind to get me what I want to do. And, and uh, I've been doing that. I've, is it working? Yeah. Hey, it's working! <sighs> yeah, I've actually, uh, I think, increased my awareness a great deal through some of the techniques that I've learned from Bob and uh, you know I have a, a huge understanding that I, I didn't have before because on a daily basis I'm utilizing my subconscious mind to solve problems to understand things better and uh, I'm really on the cusp of, uh, of delivering this in, uh, in some books that I've got in mind as well as some other things that uh, Fabulous. I'm hoping to talk about maybe later. All right. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Helps. I really appreciate your sharing that. <laughs> yeah. So, would someone else from the group like to 
say a little bit about what, what is the group for you. We've got three more people present who could do that. Just speak into the mic. <laughs> speak into the mic, okay. Um, I originally became interested in uh, Bob's work primarily through the creative aspect. I was, I've been keenly interested, keenly curious about creativity for I, probably since I was a kid, but more acutely when I uh, was in my graduate studies in college. And, uh, and I didn't really realize what the rabbit hole was all about until I took a couple of his workshops. And, uh, and this thing about uh, discovering some of the, your childhood memories that you have amnesia about, what, uh, the, the thing that strikes me about it is it allows you the opportunity to view those memories from a rational point of view with a lifetime of experience that you didn't have at the time when you learned those when you were a child. It was more of a reaction. And so uh, if, you, if you can view those from a rational point of view, then you're, you're actually uh, better, better equipped to understand why when you react a certain way and, uh, and perhaps that reaction is uh, in a, in a uh, in a not so productive way, it allows you to correct that, uh, and it offers you, yourself to give yourself corrective feedback on on behaviors that uh, uh, that don't serve you as well as as, uh, as they should. So, and I'm still learning. So that's just a part of it. Uh, I mean, I uh, in in one short session here, there's no way we can cover everything. But uh, uh, Michael touched on some good points, and uh, maybe somebody else here will offer something else. Uh, oh, got to got to mention one thing: the ethics. Bob hasn't talked about it. Michael didn't talk about it. But that's probably the most important part of the whole thing. And uh, without the ethics, none of this works. And that's uh, true. And I'll. Uh, 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 you know, if you're interested in it, there's places you can read about it. And uh, uh, I'm sure that will be brought up later. Cool. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you so much. Hey, Joe. Hi. Hi, Joe. I'm Joe Baker. And uh, hi, Bob. Hi. <laughs> Talking to the mic. <laughs> yep. Uh, there it is, my mic stand. <laughs> um, well, I met you when I came down here. And we had some uh, lunch, I think, yeah. at La Tortuga. Tortuga. And uh, you told me some of your fascinating work in dealing with uh, kind of working through people's traumas from early childhood and how they affect them through their lives. And uh, I, I, find, I find that interesting. Um, I was working on these tuning fork uh, techniques of the human biofield where, where that seems to have some impact on on um, kind of the same the same areas, it takes a long time. You have to work through, the, comb through all these areas. It can take like you know 24 hours worth of work going, working through somebody's biofield. And then you might have to do it again later. <laughs> but um, um, I've had a discussion with uh, Robert Lindsay Nathan when he came down here to see you. I went and saw him at the NR Castle, mm -hmm. and uh, he told me about what a precious resource uh, we have down here in Bob Podowski. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm blushing. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and that, uh, you know, that we, we ought to really take, uh, take heed to you know, the things that you have to offer us. Wow. And uh, I took that to heart. Well, thank you. Came to one of your presentations. Closer to the mic. Closer to the mic. The mic. <laughs> Hi, Bob. Hi. <laughs> like, That's good stuff. Yeah. Speak up. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, um, I haven't gotten to, to much of my childhood traumas yet that I can tell, other than, uh, well, coming home with full pants <laughs> and stuff like that, and. Uh, I, I haven't quite uncovered all these traumas yet, but I know they're there. But I, I've got other traumas later in life too that I'm that I'm learning to work on. 
and I'm really interested in the creative aspect mm -hmm. of of uh, the soul bonding technique and working as a team in an octologue. Oh, good. Because I know that uh, there are lots of creative things that can be done. Uh, I'm working on a project called Remedy Coin, as you know, yes. that uh, <clears throat> is kind of taking uh, damage that people have and monetizing it. And uh, like, why not? Uh, so, uh, but there's a lot of things that seem to be blocking me from making progress, and I think it's a lot of internal things. I'm trying to work on my my own self and try to make myself mm. more uh, efficient. Uh, well, that's why yeah, this this session kind of is called "Working on Our Metal Blocks." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like the kid playing with blocks. Yeah. And when you're doing creative stuff, it always feels like play. Always. If you're not feeling like you're playing, you're not being creative. And we want to see more of that in the world. Are you starting to get some of that in the group? Do you feel like the group is supportive of that? Well, I feel the group has been very supportive of my. Uh, my work. One of the questions you asked early on when we met was, "What is you know what is the thing you most would like to do with your life?" Mm -hmm. And uh, and I mentioned about the remedy coin, and and I was really uh, I've heart, had a heartfelt uh, appreciation because so many people in the group also uh, expressed that that they wanted to see remedy coin succeed as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a uh, that's a big. Uh, a big thing for me. That's one of the reasons to be in a group is there's more energy to support everyone in the group. Yes. You, you have at any given moment the benefit of the energy of all the other people in the group. You don't have that when you're alone. You can fantasize it, but it's not the same thing. Hmm. So, cool. Um, you know, and I, I think that uh, these uh, octologues and, uh, will be useful for organizations like Remedy Coin, when it comes mm -hmm. up against a challenging obstacle, right. we'll be able to put our heads together, literally. Yes. And uh, Amplification. Lock arms, whatever we do, and then uh, really uh, talk it through and think, think it through and then let our subconscious work on solving the problems. And uh, I really think that I have an intuition. I mean, you've talked about your experience with these kinds of things, but but I have an intuition that that's going to be a very powerful thing, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing great things happen as a result. Thank you. Thank you. I really you, appreciate Bob. it. Take care. All right. Does anyone else want to comment on any subject that relates to what we're doing here? I know that there are others present who have some inklings about that, but you're under no obligation to share. Anyone at all? No? Not yet. Okay. Well, I guess I should do some wrapping up at this point. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> if you've been following the discussion, you realize you don't really know yourself that well if you've got amnesia for your first five years. Let that sink in. Amnesia for your first five years is proof that you were traumatized during that time and that you had to develop amnesia in order to survive your childhood. The traumas that are visited upon us by even well-meaning parents last a lifetime unless you do something to intervene. We know now that peace can be achieved between two people. I have been part of a number of groups, quite a number actually, where we've been able to expand that to encompass eight or ten people. I literally spent thousands of hours helping people in such groups to discover what they needed to discover about themselves to become effective in the world. I gave the example earlier about the person who's left to cry, be hungry, desperate. I remember a client that I had like that. 
that I will share a little bit with you about. He was a young man. He was a very tall, skinny young man. He had to be about 6'4". From my perspective, that's pretty tall. I know there are taller people, but anyway. He looked like a beanpole. Low energy. His hair, when he bothered to comb it, would hang down limp. He looked limp, even when he was energized. And he was constantly dissatisfied with his life. There wasn't anything about it that he couldn't complain about. This is typical of people who aren't nurtured as infants. Life is miserable. He was depressed a lot. He was making a living of sorts by doing odd jobs for people. And he came to see me. And I recognized from what he presented what the origins were and what was missing in his makeup that would have changed his life? And the answer was anger. This was a man angry at the world for what he'd been through, who didn't realize he was angry because anger was a forbidden feeling in his family. I knew what that was like because it was a forbidden feeling in my family and I had to work through that before getting to where I could acknowledge my anger. So I decided to provoke him. And I did it with his per permission. I said to him, I said uh, something like, I can solve your problem for you. Actually, I, I didn't solve the problem for him. I taught him to solve his own problem. But what I said was, I can solve your problem for you, but you're gonna have to be, go through an initiation of sorts and you're not going to like it. You'll be really upset with it. It'll be humiliating. Are you willing to tolerate that to get everything you want in your life? And he said, yes. Well, I was sitting on a big cushion at the time, really big cushion. And I said, OK, kneel down over here, bend over on all fours on your hands and knees in front of me. And he did. And I put my feet on his back and picked up a book and pretended to read. Now one of the things that this guy did when he was unhappy is he'd whine. Uh, uh, I don't like this. You've all met whiners? Where do you think they learned that? Uh, the fact is that was his way of getting the little bit that he got from his parents when he was little. He'd whine at them. I ignored his whining, flipped the pages of the book. Bob? Yes? I'm not happy. Shh, I'm reading. <laughs> and I continued. And in this way, I continued to provoke him for about half an hour. And he got madder and madder and madder. And eventually, he stood up, looked me in the eyes, and he said, I hate you! I want to kill you! And I could tell from the way he said it that he meant it. He did. He meant it. Well, fortunately, before we got to that, I had already taught him that when you have emotions happening, you stand with your knees bent so you feel the ground. You gotta be grounded or you, who knows, he might have attacked me. So as he did this, I pointed at his knees and he knew that meant bend your knees because his knees were locked. And when your knees are locked, you're not connected to the ground and you're liable to fly off the handle in any direction. And you don't have much tolerance for your own emotions. So I teach people to ground themselves. I teach people how to connect to the ground. And when I did that, I said, I notice you're not whining anymore. And you don't seem helpless at all anymore. And I'm betting you're going to go out and conquer the world, aren't you? And he said, you bet! And he did. He went out and he got a high-paying technical job. And then he got a girlfriend. And then he got married, bought a house, had a baby. Last I heard, he was living the life. 
all because I provoked him into getting mad and expressing it. Well, I didn't do that arbitrarily or unknowingly. I had recognized what was going on with him because I've been trained to do that. I went through lots and lots of training to learn to do that sort of thing. I observe. I observe posture, voice tone, things like musculature and inconsistencies in the structure of the, of the body. I notice whether the top and the bottom of the body match or the left and the right expressions on the face match. They don't always. And when they don't, it tells me something about what did this person go through when they were little. Having that information, I can then suggest experiments. Now please note, what I do is not clinical. Clinicians act upon you. You're the patient and they do something to you. I don't do that. I educate your conscious and subconscious minds so they come into harmony with each other. That's all I do. But it's an educational process, not clinical. Which of course puts me outside the realm of the clinician's rules. And occasionally I do things that clinicians wouldn't do because they weren't trained to do, don't know how to do, and haven't a clue most of them what they're doing. I've written a book on this, it's called Soul Bonding. Those who want to see it, send me an email that says SB for soul bonding, SB book in the subject line. And I'll send you a copy of the book electronically. My email is Boris Air, that's B O R I S H E I R. My father's name was Boris, I'm his heir. Boris Air at yahoo.com. You send an email to that address and it says SP free book or SP book, and I'll send you a copy of the ebook for free. I, now, I got to tell you, you will not find that this material in the book is particularly in line with what clinicians do and what people learn in universities. Very little of what I do is learned in university. I never learned it there. It, little of it is taught there. But the creative work in this field takes place outside of academia and therefore outside of the reach of the cartels that control academia. And so academia doesn't like some of the techniques that I teach. I don't just use the technique with my clients I teach the client to use the technique so they can be independent. Clinicians don't, don't do that. They want the client dependent on them so they keep coming back and paying a fee. I have worked with people long term when they needed that, but very little in recent years because I teach them how to do the work. They could do it for other people. I call myself a growth consultant my method is soul bonding. It is drawn from six clinical methods that I've combined in a unique way, and it works. I can't promise it works for everyone, and there are clients I've had occasionally in the past who got scared and ran away and didn't finish the work, but those who stick around, they get it. They get the results. Life changes beneficially. So I want to encourage everyone, look for this kind of information, find it, use it. We have this resource here. We have a group. It's a small group and within our group there are people who can't be there all the time. So we have people coming and going. Later on, this group will morph into a group where the people are there pretty consistently over a period of time. Six months maybe. In six months you can transform your life dramatically. I mean hugely dramatically transform your life for the better. 
using this technique. It's available. Come and get it. <laughs> we still have some openings in the group. We're short of women at the moment. We've got two women in the group, only one of whom is able to be here right now. The other one may be on her way. She said if she gets here today, it'll be late, but we'll see. But we've got two women and uh, one, two, three, four men. We're looking to top out at about 12. So we've got a few slots. For those of you who want to learn this arcane mystical process, it's really not all that mystical. It's very straightforward. It's based on neuro-linguistic programming, as taught by John Grinder. It's based on Ericksonian hypnosis, as taught by Milton Erickson. It's uh, based on uh, Gestalt therapy, as taught by Fritz Perls. And Virginia Satir's method uh, of doing therapy. It's based somewhat on that. And, uh, oh, and then there's uh, Jay Haley's strategic therapy is one of the sources. Plus talk therapy or cognitive therapy, which is the least effective of them all, but the most necessary. I will mention one other thing. Thank you, Robert. And that is that we are going to be putting together a blockchain of people. Now this is a very important concept. What does the blockchain do in the world as we're anticipating it over the next few years? Well, it takes the necessity of trust in central authorities out of the equation when it comes to financial relationships and business relationships and contractual relationships. It takes that out of the mix, makes that kind of trust unnecessary. In a blockchain of people, we have the same kind of thing taking place. We're decentralizing decision making. Well, how much can you decentralize decision making? Well, ultimately, everyone becomes a decider. We have a mechanism for doing that. It's called the holomat. It is the blockchain of people. And the block is the octalog. Within a group of eight, you can have complete trust, where people bear their souls to the rest of the group and feel totally safe doing it, and will do it again and again and again for years. This is a fact. This works. Well, when we have it among, when we can teach a couple to do that, we can expand it to the group, and from the group, we can then have multiple groups forming ethical contracts with each other for a common cause. That's the holomat, the blockchain of people. It will do for people in their personal relationships exactly what the blockchain does for financial and business relationships. And it's the missing piece. Those who think the blockchain, the computerized blockchain, is going to solve the whole problem, you're mistaken. Because you haven't dealt with the ethics. Now how do octologues and blockchain of people deal with ethics? Well, first of all, you have to know what is an ethic? How many of you have been to school and studied ethics in school? Anyone else? Yes, a couple, a few, yeah, okay, most of you, great. Okay, now, from those of you who have not yet read my book, Flourish, what's an ethic? Anybody? What's an ethic? Define it. I don't hear any volunteers. A standard of behavior. A standard of behavior? Well, that's a pretty good first cut. A list of morals. A list. Ah, who decides? Well, you're, 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 you're handling the branches instead of the root. Let's go to the root. Every ethic has two parts. 
One part is a value or a description of what it is you want more of or what you want to maximize. If you want to maximize money, you could use money as the basis of an ethic. The Soviet Union did material well-being for everyone. Now, part two of the ethic, any ethic, is a belief or belief system that tells you how to act to get more of the thing you value. The Soviet system was a tyrannical so communist regime. It was supposed to give it to them, material well-being for everyone. What was the result? Almost universal poverty. That ethic was not valid. Which brings up the fact that you can pick arbitrarily any value, any belief system, put them together and call it an ethic and live by it if you want to. And this is why people say ethics is arbitrary. But what those same people don't tell you, certainly not in school, is that not all ethics are valid. In order to have a valid ethic, when I follow the belief system, I must actually get more of the thing I value. That makes the ethic valid. Oh, okay. Well, how about might makes right? If I have might, I'm entitled to anything I want from anyone. You could make an ethic of that. Would it be valid? Well, it looks like it sometimes when people who are unethical do terrible things and acquire wealth. But you have to understand those are parasites in our society. They don't contribute. They're parasites. And if there's enough of them getting their way, they destroy the host. You understand parasites can destroy the host? That's what's going on with might makes right. It's not a valid ethic for the long term. Okay, so we know that's an invalid ethic. There are lots of other invalid ethics. How do you make one that is valid? Well, first of all, you've got to pick a value that allows you to do it, because if you pick money, you won't get there. You pick happiness, it won't work, no matter what the belief system is. Happiness doesn't work. Lots of other things don't work. What does? Truth, awareness, love, and creativity. These four values work. When you maximize them and have a belief system based on that, you get more of those things. What's the belief system? The belief system is simply that an act is ethical if it increases one of these four resources for at least one person, including the person acting. Note, without limiting or diminishing them for anyone. If I can increase truth, awareness, love, or creativity without limiting or diminishing any of those four for anyone, I've done something ethical. And if one person is harmed or diminished, guess what? It's not ethical, no matter how many benefit. You all follow that? All right, it's very simple, but putting it to practice as the core ethic for your life, you better be honest with yourself or you won't be able to do it. That's where the soul bonding comes in. So soul bonding becomes a step on the pathway to the future that we want. Not everyone's ready for soul bonding. When I first joined a therapy group in 1973, I really wasn't ready for it. I was terrified out of my mind. I had never been in a therapy group and everyone else in the group had. So they knew what to expect and I didn't. And it was very difficult for me. But it was a turning point. It was after that three week workshop <laughs> where for three weeks we, <laughs> the group worked on ourselves morning, afternoon and evening every day for three weeks, nonstop. It was a turning point and life got better and better and I decided even before then I wanted to make this my career. Some of you looking for careers, you could do a lot worse than become soul bonders. Come to a soul bonding group, learn how to do it, now you're a soul bonder. You can go out and get paid for it. Wow. Do well by doing good. 
I want to create an army of soul bonders. And I need your help. I need your help to make it happen. It ain't going to just happen on its own. And I've been working towards this for 45 years. So believe me, it isn't easy. I'm not asking you to do something easy. I'm asking you to join me on the most worthwhile quest that you could possibly imagine in your life. And you haven't been down the trail. You haven't seen the destination. You don't yet really have a basis for believing that peace, prosperity, and freedom are available. Unless you take my word for it. I live free. Nobody runs my life. My parents, long dead, don't run my life. My school teachers don't run my life. My childhood caregivers don't run my life. And neither do the people in Washington run my life. No one runs my life. I am as free as you can be and still be functional in the world. Hey, that's kind of a cool thing. There are others out there that might want to learn that. Now, I mentioned Dana Martin a while ago. What she knows about peaceful parenting and upbringing and educating of children is something else. Every parent needs that information. If you haven't read her work, go get it. If you're, if you're a parent or you want to be a parent or you're thinking about someday being a parent or if you're just a parent who might have made some mistakes, hmm, we do well to learn this stuff. It's good stuff. Lives get better. I'll now open the frame to questions. Do you have a question? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Because what? Oh, yes, I'll repeat any questions that anyone asks. The question is uh, for all of our friends all around the four corners of the earth who are watching this, uh, how well does this stuff, the people that contact you, that be remote, the virtual, Zoom, Skype, does any of that stuff work for you? A, uh, a pilgrimage to, to rock. Oh, oh, good question. Such a bad thing. Okay. The question is, do people have to come to Acapulco to, take, to benefit from this technology, from this know-how? And the answer to that is no. You don't have to. Can you get some of it remotely? Yes. I have a book I'll send you. It'll help. I do individual soul bonding sessions with people via various kinds of video chat. It's not the same as being here in person. And the reason is that our subconscious minds take in vast amounts of information that we don't know we're taking in. So if you're in the room with me, I'll be able to see how you're breathing. I'll be able to notice when your facial muscles do very brief transitions. <laughs> they call it uh, micro expressions. And those are real. And there's much to be learned by watching those things in people that you're in the room with. Much harder to do on Skype or Messenger, video chat, and so on. Now, I do have clients that I see remotely. And I'm happy to do that. If I had it to do over, if I were 30 years old now, and there was someone here in Acapulco who could do the things that I routinely do, I would want to come to Acapulco and get it firsthand. So, you can get some of the message by going to the website titanians.org, T-I-T-A-N-I-A-N-S, titanians.org. There's a whole lot of articles there. Some of it's on soul bonding, some of it's on octolog, some of it's on ethics. And there's a whole section there about me if you want to know about my background. Who, who the hell am I to be offering such stuff? Well. 
My background is described in some detail. You can look me up in a variety of ways. I have a lot of videos online here and there. You can look up some of those. Uh, as I said, I've been at it for quite a while, <laughs> 45 years. I started on the ethics aspect of it in 1984 when I met John David Garcia. And he had just published a book that I recommend to you called Creative Transformation. It's not easy to get hold of that book, but it's still available. And you can download it chapter by chapter online at a website called C.org, S-E-E dot org. It's on Amazon. Oh, it's on Amazon. Oh, good. Don't buy from Amazon. <laughs> anyway, um, so I want to invite you to get involved any way you can which is really my answer to that question is, if you can only do it electronically, do it electronically. At least learn what you can. And I would make the trip to Acapulco, I would have made it when I was 30. If I had known then the need I had for it and what it would result in, I'd have made it down here somehow. Somehow. To those of you who are saying to yourself, I'd love to go but I can't afford it, hey, I have a suggestion for you too make the decision to come, then figure out how to afford it. I guarantee you, if you make the decision first and then look for the way, there is like a 95% probability that you'll succeed in getting here. Whereas if you wait to make the decision until you know how you're going to get here, you probably won't. I went through this the first time I offered a group of clients a three-week intensive workshop because I put on a couple of those. Three week intensive. A lot of work goes into that. And every client I had said, I couldn't possibly do it. I can't afford it. I don't have the time. I, I've got a job. I've got family to take care of, et cetera, et cetera. They had all these reasons why they couldn't do it. And I made the same suggestion to them. Decide first that you will do it and then figure out how. And the worst that can happen is you'll fail to do it you'll have made the attempt. And every one of them came, even though they all told me they couldn't. I say the same thing to you. If you're watching this remotely, get yourself down here. Spend a few weeks or a few months down here transforming your life. You can't make a better investment. It's, it's not expensive to be here. Cost of living is lower than it is in the States and a lot of other places. It's comfortable. You don't have to put up with shoveling snow and a few other inconveniences that I know you have to put up with in Canada or the States or in Europe or anywhere else. So get down here. Any other questions? Yes? The, the book, um, first one, is, is it like a pre, pre first? Like, uh, you get the answers in the book or do you know like, what's, what, what's the book about? There are really two books. The first one was the seventh one that I wrote, and it's available on Amazon. It's called Flourish, and it's about the ethics and the octologues. Well, after I got that one out and a lot of people had seen it, I realized it's not as easy to form these things as I had hoped. Why not? And then I realized people are scared to know who they really are. And you have to be honest. To be in an octologue, you have to be honest with the other people in the octologue, or it won't work. And to be honest with them, you've got to be honest with yourself. One of the requirements of being in an octologue is giving and receiving feedback from other people in the group. So, to recap, your question is, how much of what I'm talking about is in the book? The other book is called Soul Bonding. It's available directly from me for free. It outlines the kinds of trauma that children typically undergo, the effects of those traumas on the children, and how that manifests in the adult that they grow up to be, the problems, the kinds of problems they have. And then I give examples of how I've applied the soul bonding method in my work with these individuals 
and how that changed their lives. That's in the book. Will that give you enough information to use all of it all the time in your life? Some of it, not all of it. For example, I include a description of a process that I learned from John Grinder. Now, Grinder was one of the co-inventors of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. And he taught me a process called the six-step reframe. It is a step-by-step -step process whereby your conscious mind talks with your subconscious mind and negotiates a change in something that is part of you. A change in a habit, for example. A change in a way you react to something, for example. Any kind of change that you want in some behavior controlled by your subconscious, which is most of your behaviors. The book outlines the six steps. It doesn't tell you what to do if you run into a problem with one of those steps. What happens if you hold this conversation with your subconscious and your subconscious says, well, screw you. Now what do I do? I have a solution. I can teach you that. I didn't include every possible outcome and every possible obstacle in the book. The book's a little over 200 pages. It gives you the fundamentals. It explains what the six different disciplines are that became soul bonding. It explains why it's different than what you get in any school. You won't get this stuff in school because the schools don't teach it because the stupid professors don't know it. They scorn it, they sneer at it because I don't have their credentials. Well, their credentials only exist because they're part of a cartel. And if you don't understand cartels, go online to titanians.org and look up cartel. And you'll see several articles that address what a cartel is and why it's a bad thing and why we need to avoid cartels. I made up my mind in 73 that I'll never again join a cartel, and I haven't. Now, I've made sacrifices for that because when you join a cartel, you're going to make money by being part of the cartel. So, to wrap this up, There are many dimensions to what you can do to manifest the life you've always wanted. I recommend you get started with this body of knowledge. Know yourself, know what that means in terms of your interactions with other people, become part of a group that has a high level of trust capability. You don't start off that way. But you get there, you get to where you really totally trust these other people. And then begin forming octologues to make things happen in the world where all of that preparation will pay off big time. So I thank you all for being here. I thank you all for looking in through the video. And I hope this has been helpful to lots of people. Thank you.